All right, so we are going through the book of Genesis. We've been going through Genesis for a long time now. We've been going through Genesis for a good chunk of the year. I think we started right before the summer. We've taken a couple chapters every week. We're almost done with it. Today, we're gonna finish 45, only got about halfway through 45, and then we're gonna go 46 and 47. But one of the things that's really been exciting for me and hopefully exciting for you is the refreshing way that we see in Genesis how deep our roots of faith go. I I pray that it's been as refreshing to you as it has been to me. And what I mean by that is the idea that the roots that we have in faith are so, so deep, not just within history, but within the heart of God. This idea that the things that God has been doing has been going on for thousands of years, and when we see that, it puts us in our proper place. Rather than being the kind of people who um, sit uh, and uh, consume uh, the news or consume um, pop culture or consume what our friends are doing through social media and just consume and consume and consume, and, and through those mediums are convinced that the world revolves around us, that everything kind of rises and falls on us and our attitude, it is refreshing to be able to come to the word and be reminded that the universe does not revolve around you. I mean, we're, we're, it's a progress. We're, we're getting there, brother. For me, it is refreshing to be reminded because you're right, it, it, we lose sight of that. We're convinced, we, we, we get convinced. The enemy convinces that, man, it, it really is all about you and how you think and what you want and your desires. And that drives your decisions and that dictates where your money goes and that d- decides what gets on your calendar and what doesn't get on your calendar. And, and that decides for you when you're at church who's worth your time and who's not worth your time. So it is refreshing to me and hopefully to you that as we read the word of God, it is a reminder that it's not about you, it's about him and we're following his footsteps. We're not all following yours, which is good because you don't know where you're going. But the other thing for me is the humbling nature of being able to trace the wonders of God's ways all throughout scripture. Going all the way back to the, to the beginning, right? The, the, the first book that we've got in, in this Bible and being able to trace the gospel message thousands of years before Jesus was ever born. For me, that's humbling because it reminds me that while I may be overwhelmed and have a feeling right now that things are out of control, they are not from his perspective because if the God of the universe could have a plan of redemption before mankind even sinned, I'm confident that he'll get me through tomorrow, right? That thing that I'm worried about is going to get taken care of because his eyes on the sparrow. Nothing is out of his reach. Nothing is blind to his eyes. So, for me, that's one of the refreshing things that we've experienced as we go through Genesis. So, just a quick reminder on where we are. Last week, Joseph was confronted with his brothers again um, after 22 years of not seeing them. This is um, kind of like 42-ish, all the way up through 45, and he tested their hearts And last week we understood the application that that principle of what Joseph did to his brothers of testing them to see what was in their hearts, that is a a concept or a principle that's written all throughout scripture because tests and trials haven't gone away. God uses those in the same way Joseph used them to reveal his brother's hearts. God uses those to reveal things inside of our hearts because we can be our own best lawyer and convince ourselves of some of the worst decisions ever and tell ourselves, no, this is a really good decision and my heart is pure on this. But in the middle of a trial or a tribulation, the stuff that's deep down in there you didn't think exists starts bubbling to the surface. And by God's grace, it's not a thing you would have chose, but he used to bring things to the surface. This pandemic is a perfect example. There are things about the church that we didn't realize were an issue until this thing happened. There were things about your individual life that you did not realize were issues, were a vice until this thing happened. So while we would not have lined up for, yeah, I'm gonna get in line for pandemic because God's gonna do things through pandemic. We would not have lined up for that. By God's grace, he has worked some amazing things through this and he is transforming us through this. So that was one of the things we learned. The other thing was the moment when Joseph at the end of 45 declared, well, the middle of 45, but where we ended last week, that uh, it was God who sent him uh, to Egypt and let him go 
through all of these trials and these tribulations. And that reminder to us is that God is still control of his universe and he is intimately involved in the daily workings of your life. That he is the God of the stars in the heavens and also um, that lost pen in your house that's driving you nuts because you know you put it there, but it's not there anymore. These things that kind of get under our skin that we think God doesn't have time for, that's not the God that we meet in Genesis. Amen? So, with that in mind, we're gonna pick up where we left off in 45. Um, After the family reunion uh, in 45, Pharaoh invites Joseph's uh, entire family to come move to Egypt during the last five years of the famine. So Pharaoh kind of puts together um, uh, this caravan of gifts and an invitation uh, to Jacob and sends all the boys home uh, to their father to invite him and everyone who's still left at home to move to Egypt. So let's pick up the story in Genesis 45. We're going to go to verse 25. And my apologies for the screen. Uh, they're trying to work on getting the big screen to work. Some of you are like, I didn't even realize that was the big screen. I thought it was like a picture-in-picture thing going on. Uh, I'm 6'10", so I tend to block just everything that I stand in front of. So if you can't see it, you know, Uh, bring your Bible. (laughs) Genesis 45, 25 says this. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father, Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel, that's that's Jacob, Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, let's pause right there. And let's reflect on the idea, the the fact that the brothers had been lying to their dad for 22 years. They told their dad that Joseph was eaten by a wild animal and they covered it up by covering his coat in blood. They lied to their dad. So for 22 years, these boys have been lying to their dad and now Jacob is confronted with the truth. And what's interesting is that the truth that he's confronted with has two sides. It's a coin with two sides. On one side, the truth is that he gets to have his son back. Joseph is alive. He gets Joseph. On the other side of the coin is the truth that not only does he get Joseph, but his entire family gets to inherit salvation by moving their family to Egypt. So the news that the boys bring to Jacob is twofold. You get your son, you get Joseph, and your entire family gets salvation. Now both of those pieces of information revived him. But in verse 28, Jacob responds, it is enough, Joseph my son is alive, I will go see him before I die. So while both truths revived him, there was one of those truths that was infinitely more valuable to him than the other. Do you follow? Both were true, but one really meant more and was most valuable. It was, in his words, enough. Now, for a moment, I just want to think about Jacob's response because there's a principle in here that I want to um, kind of pull apart and tease for just a second. And it's the idea of people being the most valuable thing in the universe, okay? Now, I want to use this illustration. Um, Some of us in here are married. um, And when you got married, um, there were a couple things that were true about your marriage that you inherited in marriage. Um, You inherited um, through marriage um, a helper, somebody in the home who can help with the stuff, right? Can help with the dishes, can help with dinner, can help with balancing the checkbook, can compliment your weaknesses. Some of you are like, oh, that's not how my marriage works. <laughs> but the idea is that in marriage, you, you gained a helper, right? Um, just for laughable, practical um, uh, illustrations, you also gained like a tax benefit, 
right? Most of us didn't get married, so we would gain a tax benefit, but that is something that is true when you get married. You also gain more wisdom because you bring another perspective. And all of these things are true. It's one side of the coin. It is a truth that happens when you get married, but the other side of the coin is that you also get your spouse. In my marriage to, to Sarah, I, I gained all of those things I just said. I gained a helper. There's tax benefits. There's, more, there's infinitely more wisdom now that I've married Sarah. But above all of those things, the truth that I treasure most is that I get Sarah. Sarah is enough. It's the same way with children. Like when you have children, um, you gain a full home, right? There's a lot more noise in your home than there was before you had children. Good and bad, right? Lots of things break that didn't need to be broken, but that leads to replacing things that probably should have been replaced anyway. When you get children, there is um, a stretching of your faith that you didn't know was needed or possible. But above the faith stretching, above um, the full home, what you get when you have children is your children. You get your children. Now I'm saying this because there is a principle that I think all of us understand that Jacob illustrated when he said, it is enough that my son is alive, that we should dissect and apply. If this principle is true, we should dissect and apply to our spiritual life and our relationship with God. If this thing is true in these relationships with people, that we do gain these things, but we also gain the person, and the person is infinitely more valuable than the things we gain, then let's apply this relationship, this principle to our relationship with God. And this is not foreign. Lots of people in the Word of God dissect this. David is good at this. Um, uh, The sons of Korah, who wrote um, some of the Psalms, um, say this, Psalm 73, 25, says it this way, "Um, whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. The idea being that in Christ we receive an inheritance. We receive what we're doing right now, the church. We get each other, right? We get the joy of of the moment we had just a few minutes ago of worship, the powerful moments of being able to just close our eyes and fix our eyes on Christ and just be transformed by by the songs that we hear our brothers and sisters singing around us and knowing what that does on the inside of our soul. Like, we get that. That's the thing we inherit. But what's infinitely more valuable than that moment is Jesus. Like we get eternal life, we get a transformed heart, we get new desires. Those are all things that come with coming to Christ, but infinitely more than all of those things that we get that are true, we get Jesus. And it is enough to have just Jesus. And if it's not, then your priorities on why you're here and why you submit yourself and call yourself a Christian, they are out of balance. And that is not my prescription or or diagnosis. That is the Bible's diagnosis. That is the Bible telling you that your priority is out of whack. Because if, if Christ is not enough, if he's not the treasure buried in the field that you sold everything for, then when you dig that treasure up for a better, happier life, when things go south, that treasure that, that promised you a happy life, when things aren't going happy, you're going to start questioning whether you did this in the first place, why you did this in the first place. But if Christ like Paul says, is enough. Like David says, God, you're enough. I'm not, I'm not quoting him verbatim, like there's no verse where he says, well, David says, ah, God is your enough. But if you take the entirety of everything that they wrote, that's basically what they're saying. I'll forsake my entire life. The present sufferings, they don't compare to what I am going to inherit in him. Him, Jesus, just Jesus. He's what it's all about. And if that's not what it's all about, then you have this whole thing wrong. And you need to come to the Lord in prayer and ask him to change you. Because the sad fact is that if, this, if your balance is out of whack, you're probably not the only one. There are lots of church folk in churches all across the country where Jesus, to them, he's not enough. I need Jesus and some other stuff. I need Jesus and um, a, a nice, fully funded 401k. 
That's what I need. I I need Jesus and I need my hobbies. I need Jesus and I need my kids to behave. I need need Jesus and my wife to get off my back. You following me? The church is filled with people who would say, yeah, yeah, well, okay, I'm with you, it's Jesus. But in practice, he's not enough. It's always him and we've gotta have something else to fill us because we are not full on Jesus. Are you, are you following me? So my prayer as we read through this as a reaction to what Jacob says, it is enough that my son is still alive. I want to go see him. My son is enough. My response as a pastor and for us as a church is, Lord, don't let our hearts be full so full of the world or, or so responsive to, to the, the things that genuinely come through our relationship that we want the gifts that you bring and the stuff you do more than we want your face. Lord, don't let us be the kind of people who fill our calendars with so much church busyness that we don't know what your voice sounds like anymore. The kind of religious people who are always in the church house when the doors are open and will sign up for 10 different ministries and 15 different small groups, but never sit in their, uh, their, their prayer closet at home when no one else is around and just stare at the word and pray and listen to worship music when nobody else is around and just say, God, I just want you. I want nothing else but you. I don't want us to be those kind of people. So when we say Jacob, when we see Jacob respond with a kind of desire that says it's enough to just have my son, I want that for us. I want Jesus to be enough. Amen? Amen. Let's go to verse one in verse, uh, chapter 46. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God of his father Isaac. And at that place, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. And that's important. We're going to circle back to it in a minute, but look at what, Jesus, look at what God says. He says, I, I am the God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Okay, do not be afraid because down there I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bring you up again. Verse five, so Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt. Jacob and all of his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all of his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. So the whole family moves from Canaan to Egypt. Now I called out in, the, in chapter 46, uh, verses uh, three and, uh, well, three, and four, um, three things that God promises Jacob. He says, um, look, uh, I'm going to lead you down to Egypt. Okay, so this, you going down into Egypt, and we, we've talked about this before, Egypt is always a symbol of the world. Egypt is a, is, is a type or a shadow of the world's system. It's that thing that you want to flee from. So the idea that Jacob is now going down into it, it's got to be a God thing. And God is saying, it is in fact a God thing, I am doing it. I am leading you down into Egypt, number one. Number two, while you're down there, I'm gonna grow you, I'm gonna multiply you, I'm gonna mature you, and I'm gonna bring you out again. Okay, so I'm the one who's bringing you down. While you're there, I'm the one who's gonna grow and mature you. And when I'm, when I'm see fit, when it's done, I'm the one who's gonna bring you out. So since I'm the one who's doing the bringing, I'm the one who's doing the growing, and I am the one who is doing the getting you out of there, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Now this is, the not, this is not the first time this promise 
came about. If you remember when we were reading back in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 14, God told Abraham this exact same thing. The thing about it is, is it's hard to kind of get the sense of the timing of this. Um, let me read this to you and then tell you how the time between God showing Abraham this and then telling Jacob. I'll just refresh your memory. Genesis 15, 13 through 14. You don't have to turn there. It says, the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be and excuse me, it will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, and I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So when God told Abraham that in uh, Genesis 15, between that period and God telling Jacob this in Genesis 46, 200 years had passed. Two hundred years. Now, can we all just say, God's a patient God? <laughs> God knew it was going to happen. He told Abraham this was going to happen, and now it's starting to happen. But the crazy thing is that 200 years between it happening, we still got another 400 years before it's fully fulfilled. So God's telling Jacob, hey, I'm leading your family down here and I'm going to prosper them, but it's going to get so bad in the prosperity that they're going to turn on you and they're going to start attacking you. And at that point, still, don't be afraid. I'm going to pull you out of there, but it's not going to happen for another 400 years. There's a couple things at work here. One, what does it say about God's character that he waits 200 years before he starts fulfilling a promise and then another 400 years before it fulfills after that? It, it reminds us that his timing is not your timing and that a lot of the things that he has spoken to you, you might not see in your lifetime. The only thing you're supposed to do is by faith, plant that seed, water that seed, do what you're supposed to do in obedience and then some other generation is gonna reap the benefit of the thing that you did and you're gonna have to be okay with that. What does this say about God's character? That he would allow his people, he would lead his people down to a place where he knows they're gonna go through trials and tribulations, but in the middle of those trials and tribulations, he's gonna pull them out, he's gonna prosper them, and he's, he's gonna pull them out, and in the middle of all that, he tells them not to fear. What does this tell us about God's character? What, what, what ways could this possibly comfort us here today as we're reading Genesis 46? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is this idea that God has always, not just here in 46, but it's repeated numerous times throughout Scripture, God has always chose to purify and and prosper his people through the fires of tribulation. That's how the early church was born. The early church for the first one, two, three hundred years was birthed out of persecution. Now how, how Christianity spread so wildly to the place that it would affect us here today in good old Tallahassee, Florida, I don't know. Because when, when we read the early church history, when people are confessing, I believe in Jesus, we're gonna feed you to lions. We're gonna turn you into a human candle and light the streets with you. I don't know how that kind of, of persecution resulted in us sitting around the table talking about Jesus today. But apparently in God's wisdom, this is how he does it and it works every time. He loves leading his people through the valley of the shadow of death. And while he's walking with them, whispering, don't be afraid. He's the kind of God that likes to sit us at the table with our enemies and tells us to patiently eat our meal. I'm with you. Have, have, have some manners while you're there. Just sit here with your enemies and eat your meal because I'm with you. Don't, don't be afraid. What does this tell us about God's character? It tells us that in his way of doing things, he leads his people through difficult trials and tribulations so that they can grow and prosper and then so that he can lead them on the other side but also so they can learn not to be afraid. If there was ever a message that was beneficial for us, it's this right now, today. Because everywhere you look, and it's crazy. I was talking to one of our church members this week. It's wild. You can't watch any corner of the news without doom and gloom. It's affected everything, right? It's not just politics. Let's turn on some sports. Ah, uh, no, no. Let's turn on weather. No, no, no. 
everyone's got an angle and everyone wants to sell you something and it doesn't matter what, what um, sphere of society it is, everyone's got a perspective that they want you to buy into. It is a very difficult time to live. And God says, I know, I'm leading you through this. Don't be afraid. Stop grabbing on to fear. Stop feeding your soul fear. Sit down and eat this meal in the presence of your enemies and watch how I'm going to change you. But here's the other thing about why he does this. He does this absolutely to change you, but he also does this so that light is brought to dark places. One of the reasons why God brought Jacob to Egypt was so that the ways of God could be preached to Egypt by just watching Jacob and his sons love God. And this is a principle that should bring us comfort too because God's gonna call you to a lot of places you don't wanna go and serve under a lot of people you don't like. And part of it is for your growth and maturity, but also part of it is for their growth and maturity. Because at the end of uh, the entire world, when we all stand before God, not one person is going to have an excuse. No one is gonna say, well God, I didn't know. You never sent anyone my way. I didn't know who you were. Yes, you were. Don't you remember working? Don't you remember when, when, when you were a boss over this guy? Don't you remember how he would bring his lunch every week and pray over it? Don't you remember how he would always read his Bible? Don't you remember those conversations that he tied, tried to prompt you about at work and you told him to stop bringing that stuff in? You had an opportunity. You have no excuse. This is God's track record. He brings us through difficult trials and tribulations to absolutely change you, but also put the world in a position where they can turn and love and surrender, or they can stand before a holy God with no excuse. That's why we are all still here. Have you ever thought that? Why are we still here? Can't God just bring us home? Like, haven't we changed enough? Can we just get out of this? No, because you're the witness. You're the city on a hill, you're the salt. You're here for a reason. The reason you are here is so that there is a witness on the earth to lost people about what light looks like because this world loves darkness more than they love light. So he puts you in situations you don't like to change you, but also change the people around you. And I share this so it will comfort us because there are times coming our way ahead that are unique and difficult. If you thought that 2020 has given us everything that it has. Buckle up. We just lost another Supreme Court justice this week. So another seat is open. Just when you thought the election was as wild as it could get. I promise you, things are not going to slow down things are going to continue to ramp up because we're promised that we are increasing uh, every single moment towards the return of our King coming. And Jesus told us that there are some things we can expect. Now, I'm not standing here saying, hey, y'all better get your hearts right because Jesus is coming tomorrow. But we do have these parables um, about virgins not having enough oil in their lamps. And the expectation on Christians about being prepared for things, even though they might not happen tomorrow, living in a way that they might and so I'm ready. And so for us just sitting back, well, well, I'm just gonna wait until it's all done and then we'll do, it's not gonna be all done. Evil is going to continue to increase around the world and the responsibility will only increase on you to be a light in the darkness because the darkness is only going to creep and expand and the light has to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. We can't afford to, to hide our light under a basket, no or a bushel. No, you can't afford to do that. That's the only reason why you're still here, to be changed and to be a light. So if you hide, what's the point of you staying here? 
There is no point. So get the bushel off of your head and start being a light and stop being affected by the darkness. That's the comfort that it brings to me. The fact that in the middle of famine and pandemics and tribulation growing, God is going to use us to shine a light in this dark world to remove, remove excuses off of people who love wickedness more than they love God. So don't be afraid. Now, chapter 46 continues through the family lineage and we get a bunch of names. Um, I encourage you to go read that at home. It's, it's riveting stuff. So read those at home. But verse 28, we're going to pick it up there. So chapter 46, verse 28. <clears throat> so he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen. And when they came into the land of Goshen, okay, so let me explain something with Goshen. I want you to kind of picture um, just a world map in your mind, and you've got Africa, and on the top right, you've got Egypt. Everybody know where e Egypt is? Some of you are like, uh, I didn't know we were doing this today. I thought this was church. I'm not good at geography. So just kind of in your mind, picture Egypt. Um, where, where Cairo is, um, right, just kind of imagine that as like the hub city where most of this is taking place. Directly north of that is the Mediterranean Sea. So between the Mediterranean Sea and Cairo is this really fertile land that's fed by that water. It's kind of really nice grassland. It's called Goshen. It's an area in between the main city and the Mediterranean Sea. It's outside the city. It's this fertile land called Goshen. That's what we're talking about here. So he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him to Goshen. So this is where they were going to um, land, as their family was going to be raised. So they came into the land of Goshen. Verse 29, Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and now that you are still alive. I'll we'll just pause there for a second because this, this is a family reunion. He hasn't seen his dad and his dad has not seen his son in 22 years. And they're crying as they should be. And then it switches just a little bit to verse 31. Joseph switches to his brothers after he finishes crying on his dad's um, shoulder and they kind of, oh, it's so good to see you. Joseph says to his brothers and to his father's household, I'm going to go up and I'm going to tell Pharaoh this. I'm going to say this to him. My brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. So he's saying, okay, guys, listen up. This is what I'm going to tell Pharaoh. The men, my brothers, they're shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and everything that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? I want you to say that you are servant, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. Because every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now, we're going to pause here for a second because what we're seeing in Joseph is his um, his his tender side and his wise side. All of those years of rejection of living in Egypt made Joseph a really soft man. He was really, really tender, which is interesting because the opposite um, or the offer that could have been taken from those years of rejection would have made him very hard, like many of us are. After years of rejection or years of abuse or, or years of being taken advantage of, it has made you a very, very hard person, but not Joseph. He's tender and he's soft. All those years of trials and tribulations could have made him a foolish person. He could have been a resentful person, but he wasn't. It made him a really wise dude. And we're seeing both of those aspects being manifested. And I can't help but think that those two uh, personality traits of being wise and tender are the kind of things that we should probably cling to or lean into or grab a hold of because rejection and sorrow in our lives can make us really hard and foolish, but that's not the example we see from the kind of guy who went through some of the worst things that we could imagine. And just follow me here because this is, I want this to become a practice in you. When we're gathered here on Sunday and we're reading the word, I, I don't want you just to be like, okay, well, what he said was pretty good. And then I'll come back next Sunday and I'll listen to him say something else. I want you to start developing habits 
when we're studying the word that carry over into you studying the word. So here's one of the things it does to me. So when I'm reading this and I'm seeing the, the character traits of Joseph being tender and wise, my mind starts thinking um, uh, and, and kind of um, connecting the dots here to, to something um, that was found in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus is explaining to his disciples the kind of attitude they should have or the way they should carry themselves when they go out into the world. And it's interesting the way that he tells them in contrast to the way that Joseph uh, is, is demonstrated here. And I say this because this is a practice that I want you to start having when you're reading the word, right? When you're in your Bible reading plans and it says, okay, we'll read this chapter. When you finish the chapter, don't stop. Don't just walk away. Sit and meditate for a moment. Start praying. Okay, God, what do you have for me? And he's going to start highlighting scriptures. And I want you to turn to those scriptures. And I want you to start reading how this thing that you just read in Genesis uh, 50 has to do with this thing over in Romans 9. Okay, this is a practice I want. So for me, this is one of the jumps I made. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Now I'm going here because this, in my mind, is a common thread that runs through the people of faith. We see this kind of behavior in Rahab, we see it in Deborah, we see it in Samuel, in Daniel, we see it in Jesus' teachings. The idea that we as a people of God are sent out into a world almost like prey. We are viewed by the world as prey. We are viewed as the people in the world who have the least common sense because we are people of faith. We are not grounded in science or, or grounded in the scientific method. We, we have no basis um, for the reason why we believe what we believe because we believe you know, some spaghetti monster in the sky. We're, we're the fools in the world. We're the ones who are laughed at. Right? So we are sent out into the world almost like prey, like the world are the smarter wolves who are just ready to devour us. And Jesus tells us as disciples that when we enter into the world, we're supposed to understand this, and there are two specific ways we're supposed to act. Knowing the way that the world will treat us, we are supposed to be wise like serpents and innocent like doves. I bring this up because I think that this is applicable when sharing the gospel, obviously, because the way you talk to people matters. The way you um, contextualize the gospel matters. But in addition to that, I think it also matters in your daily life and the way you choose to live. I think that when Jesus tells his disciples to live innocent as doves, I think being innocent means giving no room for increased persecution. You are going to experience persecution, so live in a way where you're not inviting more of it. You're gonna get plenty. So stop living like a hothead that invites more of it on you because you can't do things like control your tongue. You follow? Disciples of Jesus are supposed to be innocent of those. What does that mean? I think it means avoiding conflict for the sake of conflict. I'm not saying you have to avoid all conflict. Uh, it's a wise way to live, but I'm saying there's some conflict that's gonna come your way whether you want it or not. But some of us have this tendency to see the hot button issues and just run in as fast as we possibly can, waving our arms, not caring which way is up or which way is down, but because we just love conflict. We love being in the middle of it. We love stirring it. We love creating it. We love pushing it. That's not the way Jesus told his disciples to live. Some of you are like, kind of, why, why are you picking on me? It's not me. It's the Bible. Jesus is picking on you. <laughs> I think being innocent as doves means steering clear of unfruitful controversy. There is some controversy that in some ways disrupts things so that people wake up to their slumber. Jesus did this when he looked at the crowd and said, hey, all of you guys following me, you've gotta now eat my flesh and drink my blood with no context, <laughs> right? No commentary, just put it out there and then he's gonna walk away. That created a lot of controversy, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is unfruitful controversy. Get involved in the things that don't matter and will not produce gospel kingdom fruit. Being innocent as doves means avoiding that kind of stuff. What does it mean to be wise as serpents? I think what it means to be wise means um, understanding opposing views and finding ways for you to build bridges with those opposing views. 
if for no other reason, being able to keep the, the, the lines of dialogue open so that God in his grace can use you to preach the gospel to somebody who would have written you off because of something that you stand for or something that you posted. Because you either get to, to, to be right in your own eyes or you get to have a relationship. You don't always get both and you're gonna have to pick. I think being wise as a serpent means knowing when to flee, kind of like a snake does when you're out in the yard and you're walking up to it with a shotgun about to take care of business because snakes don't belong in my yard. What does a snake do? He goes up underneath a rock because he's being wise because if he doesn't, he's going to lose his head in this situation. So I think what it means to be wise as a serpent is understanding the situations that you get into and knowing now is not the time for me to dig in my heels. Now is the time for me to flee or to back off and not press on this issue. And this is a very difficult thing to learn, but I think that Jesus expects us to learn it. I think that being wise as a serpent means realizing that just because you think something doesn't mean you need to say it. And here's the reason why. Because if you wait just a day or a week or a month, your thoughts on a matter might change. But guess what can't change? People's perception of you because of what you said at that party or on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram. And you can say, well, I don't think like that anymore. Well, good luck going around to the 900 followers that you have and explaining that to all of them. And had you just waited a month to see if that thing that you really believed was going to take root or if it's something you're just wrestling with, is this something that, no, I need to just keep it or share it with my close friends over lunch. But this is not for public broadcast consumption. The big idea I'm trying to get here is that Joseph knew how to live in a foreign land and we need to take notes because we live in a very similar world that Joseph lived and he seemed to know how to figure things out in a way that would be very helpful for us. Now, towards the end or the beginning of 47, um, this plan that he had with his brothers worked and the plan was essentially this. Look, here's what we're gonna do. The Egyptians hate shepherds and that's pretty much all you guys are good at. With the exception of lying and selling your brother into slavery, you don't have a lot of marketable skills with the exception of shepherding. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go tell Pharaoh who hates shepherds anyway, that you have brought all your sheep and your stuff to shepherd um, and that you are happy living on the outskirts of town because Egyptians don't like Hebrews and they don't like shepherds. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a lose, 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 lose all around. So what we're gonna do is we're going to put you outside of the town uh, and we're going to help live, let you live out there to shepherd um, the flock. So they were like, okay, we're all cool with that. Well, they go before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's like, what are you, guys, what are you boys good at? What do you do? And they're like, oh, we're shepherds. Um, what we'd like to do is shepherd our flock on the outside of town in Goshen. And Pharaoh's like, yeah, that seems like a pretty good idea. Let's, let's do that. Let's go with that. And so um, because of Joseph's wisdom, what he did was he got his brothers to live on the outside of the town so there was no ongoing conflict with the Egyptians because they didn't like each other. There's no ongoing conflict with the, uh, the fact that they're shepherds and the added bonus of being able to live in the most fertile land in the entire area of Egypt because that was the area that was fed by the Mediterranean Sea and the, the soil was fertile. So there was always stuff for the, um, the sheep to graze on. So it was a huge win for Joseph it worked, it worked so good that Pharaoh let his uh, sheep be shepherded by the brothers and the famine continued for five more years. Now, let's go into 47 because what is gonna happen here in 47 um, is really important for us, I think, for the way that we live and where we live right now. So Genesis 47, let's pick up in verse 13. It says, now, there was no food in all the land. This is the last final five years of the famine. There was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they had bought. And Joseph bought the money into Pharaoh, brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. So we don't have money, but we still need food. And Joseph said, all right, give your livestock. 
I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, their flocks, their herds, their donkeys. And he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when the year had ended, they came to him the following year and said, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. These are the Egyptians coming to Joseph. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There's nothing left in the sight of the Lord, uh, my Lord, but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before the eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So let's, let's pause right there. Because what happened is that the famine got so bad, people started selling all their money and they had no money left to buy grain. So then they had to start selling their livestock, their only vocation, their way of living. Now it was owned by Pharaoh. But the famine continued and it got worse and they had to sell their land. And then they had to sell themselves. And by the end of this thing, they're set up in a way that for the rest of their lives, they have to give a fifth of everything that they make back to Pharaoh. Did you catch that? Everything that they owned by the end of this famine belonged to the government. Who prospered and took advantage during the famine? The government. Now, I want to tread as lightly as possible here because I was having a conversation with Chad and Christy last night about the delicacies of some of the things that I'm called to as a pastor. There are times where I want to be careful pressing too hard against the things that we believe as Americans because what it will do is immediately put up a wall so you don't hear the gospel anymore. And I want more than anything the honor and privilege to preach the gospel to you. And so I don't want you to put up too many walls before you hear the gospel. But there are some times where it doesn't matter what I say or what you hear, you're gonna throw up a wall anyway, and the only way through it is for me to just punch through it. So that's what I'm gonna do. And the reality is it doesn't matter what side of the aisle, whether you're left or right, it does not matter where you fall politically, everyone within the governmental structure was born into the same seed of sin that we understand needs to be repented of. So I'm not saying the government is bad. What I'm saying is that the structures above us that God saw fit for us to serve under are filled with people who are just as broken as we are. Now in this situation, Joseph does his best to not take advantage of the people. And I think that's one principle here. Joseph is showing mercy to people who want nothing to do with God. But on the other side of this, there is a principle that I think we should walk away with that we often kind of ignore and we don't like to talk about within the church. And it is found in Proverbs 22, seven. And the idea is that the borrower is always a slave to the lender. So I wanna press on that just for a second. The borrower, borrower is always a slave to the lender. What's happening in this story is that the Egyptians became servants to the government because the Egyptians were unprepared. Now, when I say unprepared, I understand I'm taking a little bit of a leap, but I'm applying what I know about human nature to what was taking place in Genesis 47, and I think I come out with a pretty um, solid basis for what I think was happening here. So when I say the people were unprepared and taken advantage of, what I mean uh, is that everyone in Egypt, everyone lived through seven years of plenty before they got to seven years of famine. Are you telling me that not one Egyptian walked around during those seven years and said, why are we building all these grain storages? When there was abundance and excess in everyone's account for seven years, did no one save? Did no one prepare? Did no one say, it might not always be like this, so we should do something about it. We should prepare in some way. Did nobody do that? No, they didn't. And how do I know that? Because I know human nature. What do we do in seasons of prosperity? We spend. When there's excess, 
We don't save it. We spend it. When there's more than enough, again, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, when there is more than enough, your human nature says, who gets it? Me. I get it. Why do I get it? Because I worked for it. What would have happened if the Egyptian people in that season of excess had followed what they saw the government around them doing, preparing, and started storing up themselves? Would they have, at the end of it, been slaves to the lenders or the government? Now, I don't know, and I caution you to ask too many of those questions that are not implied in Scripture, but I think outside of Scripture in this specific story, I think it should apply to us in specific ways. Because the truth is that the world, in parentheses, governmental structures run by broken people, will always be willing to save you in the middle of a pandemic in exchange for your allegiance to something. That's how the world works. I, as, as, a, as a large entity that makes you pay money to me, we will gladly save you and be your safety net if you only pledge your allegiance to the way that we say you have to do things. And right now in America, this is the greatest country on earth. This is an amazing place for us to be Christians. I love this country, but I'm promising you if we look at the word of God and what we're told is coming worldwide, we know it is not always going to be like this, and there is going to be a pressure on the people of God specifically for us to turn our back on God and pledge our allegiance to the world who tells us they're the only ones who can save us. And if you're not using this pandemic as a dress rehearsal and a practice for the things that might be coming, what's going to happen is you're going to be put in a position much like these Egyptians, that there will be no enough because in the times of excess, there was no preparation. There was, there was no time right now. I'm not calling this time a time of excess, but I'm saying, saying we are in a season of grace where God is opening our eyes and there are some things we need to be aware of and doing. If we're not taking advantage of these things, that when that time does come, you will be the first one in line to trade in your convictions for illusions of peace and safety. How do I know that's happening? Because the Bible tells us it happens in the book of Revelation. All of this are shadows of what's coming eventually down the road where, where one day a guy who will be filled with the spirit of Satan, the Antichrist, will stand up and he will on a world stage promise the entire world a false peace if you pledge allegiance to his systems. We'll save you and we'll feed your family and we'll take care of you as long as you turn your back on what you believe. So there is this tightrope we walk of people of faith that say, it doesn't matter what situation we're in, God will provide for us. But the other side of it being, we are wise stewards of the things that God has given us. A perfect example of this is the way we choose to operate as a church. We are a fully funded church. So everything that you give, Budget-wise to this church in this year actually goes toward next year. Our church right now is operating off of the cash you gave last year, and it's sitting in a checking account, and we're pulling off of that. So we're not living month to month or week to week. We're living year to year. Everything you give goes towards next year. Is that because we're a church that doesn't have enough faith that God will provide? No, we have lots of faith, but that faith is, is exercised in different ways. Rather than having to shoot from the hip and say, we don't know what we're going to do, so I hope God can do this, we have excess and we can be a blessing when the famine does hit and we can by faith not have to react by faith we can say I think we're going to sow into this area by faith and see what God does do you see both both opportunities are you exercising faith but one is a reaction and one is planned preparation and if we serve a God who could have planned out um, how Christ is going to save the entire world before the world was even created then the opportunity for us to tap into something that he already knows is there. The problem is not on him, it's on us. We're not asking. It's one of the reasons, another practical example is the fact that I prepare my messages a year in advance. At the end of every year, I put out a schedule for where we're going and what we're talking about for an entire year. 
Is that because I don't have faith on where God's gonna lead us? No, I have plenty of faith, and the faith is found is that when I crack open Genesis 47, and I see about governmental structures taking advantage of pandemics to enslave the people, that that plan that was hatched in last November before the COVID thing happened, God knew it was gonna happen and would allow me to push on this today, me not knowing until the week it happened. We can live by faith, but what God is asking us is to be the kind of people that in the middle of crisis, we are a blessing, not the ones in the poverty line saying, oh, I don't know, we didn't prepare and I don't know. You're, you're not. We're over here with non-believers and we don't look anything different than the world. How are we gonna be a light and salt if we look exactly like the world? afraid and broken um, and, and have nothing to offer. Are you, are you following? So that, that was me kind of punching through that wall. Because what that really means is that some of you are going to have to start making some different decisions. Some of you, you need to go home and have a conversation with your family about not eating out as much. Because that's, that's where most of your disposable income goes. Some of you need to go home and you need to have a conversation about what it's time to start cutting out of the budget. Do we really need that fast of an internet connection? Are we really watching this much television? Where is all of our money going? If we're gonna be disciples of Jesus, there is not one single thing in our lives that are not touched by him. He rules over everything. Our calendars, our, our finances, this is a perfect time to refinance your house. Some of you need to go home, you need to call your bank this week, and you say, please give me a quote on refinancing my house at a much lower rate for a 15-year mortgage because I want to pay this thing off because I don't want to be paying on my mortgage well into my retirement years. I want to be able to bless generations and churches and people around me and not constantly just be feeding into this same thing. Are, are you hearing me? This is a radical way to live, and I'm not asking you to do it without leading that way. We're doing that in this church and I'm doing it in my own home. We are paying off debt in my home. The only thing we owe is a house and a car and I'm in the middle of refinancing my house too. We're in the process of trying to set up um, a, a, a way so that we can be a blessing in the next 20 years and not just, oh, well, I'm 65. <laughs> I didn't even think about retiring. This never crossed my mind. I didn't know I'd make it this far. God wants to use you in this way, but it requires some discipline and telling yourself and your kids and your family, no, not this time. Some of you grew up with parents saying, no, we're going to eat. We got food at home. You know what that sounds like? You remember the old, we got food at home. Some of you need to remember that. This idea that we have a responsibility to be able to start cutting back the excess because God wants to use you. It's how you fill your lantern with oil. Now, enough of that. Let's finish on this. Genesis 47, 29. The final request of Jacob. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Jacob's final request was to follow the path of his fathers and that was to forsake the world. Do you remember Abraham following God's desire to come out from his land and his desire for him not to find his son a wife from that land but for, to find a wife who is willing to come out of that land what Jacob is saying here is that he finally, after all of his years, he's almost 147 years old, it took him 140 years to understand the importance of forsaking this world. Now, it took him a lifetime, and praise God that he finally got there, that he didn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to be carried out like his fathers were, not left in the world systems, but carried into the place of the promise. But I bring this up because I don't want it to take 140 years for you. Now, I, it excites me to look across the room and see so many young people in the room. Now, I'm talking to the old folks, but I'm also talking to the young people. I'm talking to those of you in here that are like 13, 14, 15, 16. There is not a better time to get serious about your relationship with Jesus than right now today. 
Now I know, I know, I've been there. I know what it was like to think, no, there's plenty of time to take you serious. Uh, there's plenty of time to start reading about. There's plenty of time to get serious. Uh, right now, I'm wrapped up in, in, in this thing, in this school, and, and getting a scholarship, or enjoying life. Look, there is plenty of time later. Look, you are not promised tomorrow, and the longer you waste in taking seriously your relationship with God, the further you push out enjoying the joys of Him and the more bad habits you develop in your life that you're only gonna have to get over later in your life. So make the decision now to do the hard thing, cut out the fat in your relationships. Some of you, that means relationships that are unfruitful. You need to get them out of your life because all they're doing is dragging you down. They're unfruitful and unproductive. You need to not be like Jacob and wait your entire life until you're on your deathbed before you finally get it and say, you know what? I'm gonna die tomorrow and now is a great day to walk away from this world and just give my heart to Christ. No, today is the day. Today is the day. There was never a better time than right now to get serious about your relationship with God and how you view eternal things that you can't see and touch with your hands. Amen? All right, let's pray.